Seth Rogen's cannabis brand was struggling massively until a year ago when he saved the houseplant brand, or his team and him did. They revived it, and the viability of building that brand now into a potentially global brand is absolutely possible. Welcome to this High Design Quick Pack episode. In this video, we will be explaining the transition into the US market for Seth Rogen and his houseplant brand. We're gonna break down some of the strategies, some of the tactics, and we're gonna talk about the struggles that happened in Canada and you know why they ended up leaving and splitting away from the Canopy Growth Corporation. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment down below, and follow me on all the socials. Links down below in the description. So in March of 2019, the Canadian company Canopy Growth would announce their partnership with Seth Rogen. Later that same year, Canopy Growth would also go into a partnership with rapper Drake, and they would go into a partnership, a 60-40 split of ownership. Drake owned 60%, they owned 40%. Now this was all done under the leadership of the founder of Canopy Growth at the time, Bruce Linton. He would, he's the one who, you know, set up these deals, met these people, you know, he's the one that met Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg. And here's a clip from CNBC when this first came out. Seth Rogen just launched a weed company called Houseplant. The new recreational cannabis company has partnered with Ontario-based grower Canopy Growth. Rogan teamed up with fellow comedy star Evan Goldberg to start Houseplant. Well, the easiest job on earth. You smoke all day. <laughs> the two Canada natives work together on films like Superbad and Pineapple Express. Houseplant's goal is to make it easier for people to learn to love cannabis. Rogan joins a growing roster of celebrities working with Canopy Growth. Last month, Canopy announced a partnership with Martha Stewart to develop CBD products. And its subsidiary, Tweed, worked with rapper Snoop Dogg on branded cannabis. Houseplant's first strain will be available in April through regulated retailers in British Columbia. The company plans to offer more strains and pre-roll joints through 2019. Now, here's another news clip from 2019, which is announcing the partnership between Canopy Growth and Drake. But before we start the clip, the main reason why I'm showing you guys this is I want you guys to pay close attention to the end of this news clip. Trust me, it's a critical thing to understand, to really understand this whole dynamic between Canopy Growth and celebrities. Check it out. Uh, listen, Richard, he started from the bottom, now he's reaching a whole new high. Drake, I feel like he's actually getting in late to the party here. He's getting into the pot business. He is, and you're right. He is a little bit behind the times. But, uh, you know, never mind God's plan, Janelle. How about God's strand? Uh, we're terrible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he could That could be a name for for one of the lines. <laughs> oh, it could be, and it might, it might be. Drake is teaming up with Canada's biggest cannabis company, Canopy Growth, to come out, Janella, uh, with his own uh, Canopy line. He's actually going to call it, we think, More Life. Okay. Okay. Not as uh, catchy. I think he should have gone with yours. Yeah, maybe he'll maybe he'll be he'll watch it. He watches City News, I'm sure, so he might change it. Uh, Drake will have a 60% stake in the strain canopy growth. We'll have the remaining 40%. Uh, Drake, as you say, is a latecomer in the investment boom surrounding uh, Canadian cannabis. Uh, canopy growth has already inked other celebrity partnerships with the likes of Martha Stewart, Snoop Dogg, Steph, Seth Rogen, and Gene Simmons. Uh, cannabis uh, companies they need these celebrity endorsements and deals, Janela, because rules in Canada stipulate uh, that the pot companies can't buy ads on TV or radio, so therefore they rely on these uh, celebrity influencers to to tweet and, and put Instagram posts about it to, to, to advertise in that way, because that's really uh, the only way they can do it, Janela. A bit of a loophole there with the celebrity endorsement because they're investors. They're investors, they give them a taste of it, but they use the uh, the celebrities as a, way, a means of advertising. Got it. Oh. Did you hear that part at the end? Well, if you didn't get it randomly, a couple years ago, I actually did a podcast with the founder of Canopy Growth, Bruce Linton. It was like a few months after he'd just been fired. And he actually talks to me about the reason why they even did these celebrity partnerships in the first place. It's not necessarily because they thought they were gonna do long-term brands with these people. They were really just using them for advertising. But let's just let him explain it. Looking at Canopy Growth, 
and some of their moves that they've made with different celebrities. How do you think that's going to turn out? I'm very curious on because you guys, Martha, or Martha Stewart, with Canopy Growth, Snoop Dogg, obviously. Um, yeah. So, um, well, we have uh, some beverages with Seth. Um, so yeah, yep. what we were trying to do is remember Canada has very specific rules that you can't advertise, yeah. but it doesn't mean that the news can't cover you. Oh, right. Now you're getting the curveball I'm throwing, right? Like I can't uh, okay. spend $1 on an ad, but if I happen to get a zillion eyeballs because Martha Stewart is going to work with us, that is not advertising. That is news information. That, oh, that makes sense. Can it be Martha? Can it be Martha? Can it be Martha? Can it be Martha? You know, you get where I'm going. So the first one we dropped on it was Snoop. And it was done so at the time where recreational cannabis was not available and wouldn't be available for um, well over a year. But we wanted to make it very clear. So actually it was about 10 months out. We wanted to make it very clear. We expect it was coming. And who better to open the party than Snoop? No one better. Yeah. And, and so uh, that one worked terrific because it was like, boom. And then Martha, because Snoop and Martha, because Martha, Martha's global reach the day I sold the first gram of legal cannabis sold in Canada ever. And we had media in from Japan, China, Russia, you know, MSNBC, you know, all the things, tons and tons of media. If you look at the analytics on the amount of earned coverage we got for that, versus Martha, about the same Martha was a little better. Wow. So that's a big, big, so first thing you get. Second thing is with Martha, Snoop, Seth, they all work. So with Martha, they've just launched her CBD line, at least by Snoop still sells great. And the beverages that uh, Seth and Evan and guys put together were the best. They were very detailed uh, oriented and so um, their grapefruit and lemon flavor ones uh, really hit the market like like a storm this summer in Canada and so I think um, first that those and then with each of them we had alignment where we had very clear comp models that didn't kill the company and made them good money yeah um, some of the ones that we the ones I wish I could tell you the ones we said no to like in Canada stipulate uh, that the pot companies can't buy ads on TV or radio so therefore they rely on these uh, celebrity influencers to to tweet and, and put Instagram posts about it to, to, to advertise in that way because that's really uh, the only way they can do it. You know? A bit of a loophole there with the celebrity endorsements because they're investors. They're investors, they give them a taste of it, but they use the, uh, the celebrities as a, way, a means of advertising. See, that reporter gets it. He knows. Now, let me just pose this question. If you want to build a brand, a long-term brand in the cannabis space, would you really want to partner with a cannabis corporation that is really just using you for your marketing and promotion? While, yeah, all of those celebrities, yeah, they got their bag, they made, they made their money. But that doesn't mean by, you know, there's by no means the right people to do a long-term partnership with, to actually build a true valuable brand, which takes time. I mean, even in early 2020, less than a year after Drake and Canopy had partnered together, it didn't seem to be going well. More life, right? More life, more life yeah. growth, right? I, I love that, that branding too. Now, how has that gone though? Because I haven't really heard a lot. I don't. I just don't, I don't know exactly what's going on with. with well, as you'll recall, I did get fired about 15, yeah, I know. 15 I know. months I know ago. So I, I don't really know and I haven't seen anything, but yeah. word is it's not happening. And another story that's making headlines today has to do with Drake and Canopy Growth. They had a bit of a partnership, but they're parting ways now. Do we know why and, and what more about this deal went sideways? Well, it's kind of a mystery at this point what is going on, but new financial documents reveal that this split between the two parties here, uh, it actually happened in March. Now, there had been hints for just over a year, ever since the two sides struck that joint venture back in 2019, that maybe they did not see eye to eye on their plans to sell both cannabis products as well as accessories in Canada and in the global market when that opportunity arises. Both Drake and Canopy, they're not really divulging what went wrong here, but the financial documents reveal that Canopy is actually going to have to take a $10 million impairment as a result of this partnership coming to an end. So uh, never saw eye to eye, it seems, with regards to this partnership here. Yeah, I mean, Canopy Growth was more than willing to take that $10 million loss. 
because they were getting so much free press in return from initially signing Drake back in 2019. And the Canadian canvas companies almost had too much money back then. They didn't even know what to do with it. And in the situation with Drake, it almost seemed like that was Canopy's end goal all along, just to utilize his clout and his promo for a year and then end the deal, given that he's, you know, the most famous person in Canada. When we talk about maybe like, you know, Snoop Dogg, um, Seth Rogen, and, you know, with for CBD with Martha Stewart, there's more alignment there, right? Drake's not really known for cannabis, so that definitely was just a complete clout play. But now you understand the mindset that Canopy Growth really had when it came to their partnerships with the celebrities, or at least, you know, there's different, there's kind of two different versions of it, right? There's the ones with the kind of more cannabis oriented celebrities, and then there's the one with Drake where they're just flat out using him. But you can see, right, celebrities are utilized as a loophole in the Canadian cannabis industry. And the regulations to be able to advertise via news coverage, I mean, that's pretty ridiculous how to do. So, you can start to see now how terrible of a regulatory market Canada is to build a cannabis brand in. It's incredibly hard. Well, like you heard Bruce Linton say in that interview, Seth had really put in a ton of time to help launch their cannabis drink and apparently it did pretty good, right? But when you're heavily restricted on not just marketing but also specific package limitations and a bunch of other things, the thought of really trying to build a cannabis brand that can compete on a global level seems extremely daunting. Not to mention, Canada's entire population is literally less than 38 million people. I mean, the state of California, it's got a bigger population than that entire country. Now, I've talked about this in some of my other videos about how critical it is for cannabis entrepreneurs to pick the right markets to launch their brand out of. I typically usually suggest always looking for bigger markets if possible. Also, try to figure out something where the regulatory system is going to you know, cater to your uh, you know, your type of business, your resources, whatever that may be. Now, the last thing I'll say about Canada's legal cultivation infrastructure as a whole is it's very corporatized and consolidated because Canada legalized cannabis all at once at the federal level. So really big business came in, big money came in. So the number of different cultivators, you know, it's, it's much more consolidated, not as, you know, uh, diverse and not as fractured. And just in general, if we look at California, there's obviously just more people there, there's gonna be more growers there, right? So let's say if you were relying on, you know, cultivators to, you know, grow for your brand, you know, having a broader selection, a bigger selection, that's gonna be beneficial, right? And you're gonna get that in California. And I bring that up, obviously, because that's going to be important here when we talk a little bit more about the houseplant brand and Seth Rogen. But let's start with the entrance into America. So in July of 2021, the public got news that Seth Rogen's cannabis brand and Canadian pop producer Canopy Growth were parting ways, ending one of the most prominent celebrity brand collaborations since the start of the legal cannabis industry in Canada. Houseplant the cannabis venture Rogan launched with creative partner Evan Goldberg and Canopy Growth said in a news release that the end of the business relationship was mutual. I know that must have been a relief for Seth and his team to be able to get, you know, moving down south into the U.S. market, into the big leagues, down to California. Hi, I'm Seth Rogan, and if you know anything about me at all, I'm going to assume it's that I really love weed. But what you probably don't know about me is that I have been working on my own weed company for the last 10 years, and we are finally ready to launch in America. It's called Houseplant, and uh, what we're doing is bringing you the best strains of weed that have been hand-picked, and by that I mean hand-smoked, by me. Um, it's just the weed that I love that I want to be smoking. It comes in these adorable little tins. We have an orange one for sativa, a purple one for indica, and it even stacks. Another thing we're doing is making beautiful house goods for people who smoke weed. We have things like this block table lighter, which is a table lighter with an ashtray for the lid. I lose my lighters all the fucking time, but no more because this dude is hard to lose. This is just the beginning. This is honestly my life's work and I've never been more excited about anything. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Now, what's been really interesting in how Seth Rogen and his team have positioned the houseplant brand 
is it's not just cannabis, but it's also a company that sells different home goods. Think about the name house and plant and think of those as two sides of the business, but we'll get to that in more detail later on. Right. But I like the way that they're positioning themselves. The brand, it's it's broadening their potential customer base, right? And while being a lifestyle brand or being too broad of a brand in scope can hurt a lot of companies in spreading themselves too thin and not having enough name recognition, resources to be able to really sell those other non-cannabis products right away. Well, that can be a problem for many companies, but it's definitely not for houseplant whatsoever. On March 1st, 2021, Seth Rogen announced the US launch of his marijuana company, Houseplant, and said that the brand's strains would soon be available in California. Less than an hour later, Rogen tweeted that the site had been taken offline to get it in better shape to support all the traffic. Now, did the website actually crash? I don't know. I'm sure it did. But if it didn't, well, that's a smart PR stunt. Regardless, the amount of free publicity that that alone got Seth Rogen and Houseplant was pretty insane. Now, the brand approach that has been taken by Houseplant in the US market has been really to push seemingly an extremely expensive, high quality craft canvas brand that has limited supply. When we look at the house goods, right, the house side of the business, they sell on their website, right? I'm not gonna lie, when I saw the prices, I see what they're charging, it seems a little ridiculous, but hey, I'm probably not their target market. And the prices vary, and it seems like they do these limited supply drops of these household smoking accessories. But I mean, I came across an unboxing video on YouTube where this girl unboxes a $500 rolling tray that she bought from Houseplant. So they do limited drops of different household products, right? Think about it like uh, Supreme, right? Or, you know, I don't know if they ever bring back old designs or anything, but that's the model. Limit supply, you know, that's where you're gonna charge higher pricing, you're gonna create more value, it's more exclusive, all that, right? But they don't, so they do limited drops on both sides of the business. They do limited drops on the house side and they do limited drops on the plant side, right? Now, the house plant brand does not grow any of its own cannabis. It really just sources their cannabis from different cultivators around California, which may be working for now, but I think that they definitely could run into some problems in the future when they start to scale the brand into other states and markets. And honestly, I just did some research on Houseplant and came across this really informative review on YouTube by the channel West Coast Weed Reviews. The video is from like 10 months ago. And in the video, it's two different eighths being compared to each other, right? One of the eighths is from the company THC Design, and it's the Crescendo Cannabis Strain. And the reviewer is comparing it to a Houseplant eighth, right? Now, when you do the when he does the comparison, right, he does a really good job of it. The buds look almost the exact same. It, I think it was like pretty obvious it was grown by the same people, right? They pretty much look identical, meaning that most likely Houseplant, you know, was purchasing from THC Design, you know. And funny enough, the eighth from THC Design was fifty dollars, and the Houseplant eighth was ten dollars more at the sixty dollar price point. Now, is seeing a celebrity cannabis brand that white labels from other growers in California having a high price point that uncommon to see? Well, definitely not. And I'm not, you know, I'm not hating on that. I'm not gonna lie though, the strategy that Houseplant has implemented with their house goods, this is really where I've got to commend them for, okay? This is really smart, very smart. The team over at Houseplant have obviously done their homework and really have analyzed the industry and looking at companies and for example, like Cookies, Jungle Boys, Runts, right? The companies that have built really popping clothing companies. There's Cookies Cannabis and there's Cookies Apparel, right? The apparel allows for cookies to reach markets, countries where they cannot get their cannabis there yet. 
So it's a great way to establish brand presence, especially if you are trying to go national and international. And it also diversifies the company's revenue streams. Now, the folks over at Houseplant obviously saw that and they made a really smart decision to use that same tactic, but instead of trying to build a clothing brand, well, it's a house goods and design brand that syncs up well with the cannabis side or the plant side, right? I mean, quite literally, you can see it in the name. There's the house goods and the plant goods. They even have two separate websites, two separate Instagrams. Anyways, I like how they identified a successful strategy with the clothing brands like Cookies, but they were smart enough to go and implement that strategy in a different vertical. If any of y'all have read the famous book, The Blue Ocean Strategy, this quite literally is what they did. Now to quickly define the Blue Ocean Strategy for folks that aren't aware of what that is, well, it's a strategy referring to finding market for a product where there is no competition or very little competition. The strategy revolves around searching for a business in which very few firms operate and where there is no pricing pressure. That's a key word, pricing pressure. And while the cannabis side may have pricing pressure, well, it doesn't really seem like the house side has any. Because does a $500 rolling tray seem like there's any pricing pressure? Or how about a $300 standing ashtray? Shit, they even got a pack of rolling papers on their site selling for $10. Let me pose this question. Let me know what you guys think down below in the comments. I would love to hear your opinion. Do you think they're making more money off cannabis, the plant side, or they're making more money off the house side? Make up your own decision, but in my opinion, they're making a whole lot more money on the house side. And what really ties a bow on this whole thing and makes it work is that, well, the $500 rolling tray or the couple hundred dollar pottery, well, that was designed or at least approved by the one and only Seth Rogen. And I always talk about how many celebrity cannabis brands fail, like, for example, Drake's cannabis brand, because the general public doesn't associate them or associate Drake with cannabis. But Seth, well, shit. He's probably the most famous stoner in this new Hollywood era slash generation. So the general public definitely associates Seth Rogen with cannabis. But the houseplant team has been really, really smart about how they have been having Seth mainly focus on the house side, at least publicly, not only to help sell more house goods, but also because while I'm sure Seth is very knowledgeable about cannabis, He's not the one growing it. He's not the one bringing the genetics. And I think if he were to just be involved on the cannabis side, the friction there could be a little more abrasive and apparent, but they're not doing that, which is really smart. Instead, well, he's contributing on the other side by doing his own pottery. So the appearance of the celebrity, and in this case, Seth Rogen publicly makes him still seem extremely engaged and involved in the brand. And I'm not saying that he's, he's not, right? I'm just saying perception is reality. When we look at the cannabis brand by Travis Scott, it definitely doesn't hit nearly as hard because it doesn't seem like he's continuously engaged in the brand, even though he probably put in a similar amount of work initially when it comes to selecting the strains. But the two big differentiators Seth has over Travis Scott is that we have seen Seth in multiple really famous stoner movies. And well, he's making pottery. And maybe to top it off, it seems that Seth has done way, way more appearances and promo when it comes to his brand, the houseplant brand in comparison. Anyways, I'm not trying to bash Travis Scott and I know he just started his brand, it's just coming out. And so we'll have to see how that does. But that's just some food for thought, right? Perception is reality, especially when it comes to celebrities. Anyways, I gotta say, there is at least one person over at Houseplant that really knows their shit and is playing this perfectly. I'm sure it's a whole team of them, but I gotta clap it up for you. When it comes to the marketing, branding side, and also like how to successfully 
deliver and execute a celebrity cannabis brand and have it be viewed by the vast majority of the public as authentic, that's no easy task, okay? Anyways, I'm gonna end it there. If you guys like this High Design Quick Pack episode, please make sure to hit the like button, share the video with your friends, subscribe if you're not subscribed, follow me on all the socials, links down below in the description. Anyways, this is LMC, signing out.